This is Kick-Ass Politics. I'm Ben Mathis. Hi, folks. Before we start the show, I want to ask for your help. If you enjoy Kick-Ass Politics, I hope you'll help us reach our goal of raising our full production budget for 2016 by donating on our website at kickasspolitics.com or at gofundme.com backslash kickasspolitics. Thanks for listening, and now enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Ben Mathis, and welcome to Kick-Ass Politics. I'm thrilled to have a genuine comedy legend on the show today, someone who has been making me laugh since, well, I don't know when. Carl Reiner is an actor, director, producer, and writer responsible for some of the funniest television shows, movies, comedy albums, and books of the past seven decades. After debuting on Broadway in 1950, Carl Reiner got his big break as a co-star and a writer on Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows, where he was part of the most famous writer's room in television history, which also included his best friend Mel Brooks, playwright Neil Simon, and his brother Danny Simon, Larry Gelbart, Mel Tolkien, and according to legend, a young Woody Allen for a typist. Then he went on to become the creator, writer, producer, and actor of the beloved classic The Dick Van Dyke Show, which ran for five seasons and 158 episodes on CBS. After that, Carl Reiner went on to write and direct movies, including Where's Papa?, Oh God with George Burns, and some of Steve Martin's funniest films like The Jerk, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid, The Man with Two Brains, and All of Me. He's also continued to act for film and television in It's a Mad, Mad World, The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming, I'm not repeating myself, folks, that's the name of the movie, and more recently in the Ocean's Eleven movies and the hit sitcom Mad About You, for which he won an Emmy Award for Outstanding Guest Actor in a Comedy Series. In fact, he's won nine Emmy Awards, although according to him in our interview, the Internet has it wrong, and he actually has 12 Emmys, as well as a Grammy Award for his and Mel Brooks' hilarious 2,000-year-old man album. Plus, he's also been elected to the Television Hall of Fame. He's written 16 books, including his latest called Why and When the Dick Van Dyke Show Was Born. Today, Carl Reiner will talk about the early days of television and his start in show business as a writer and co-star of Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows and how the antics of himself and his fellow writers inspired him to create The Dick Van Dyke Show. We'll talk about his scary brush with McCarthyism and how he avoided naming names. We'll discuss writing and directing with a young Steve Martin on such comedy classics as The Jerk And, of course, we'll talk about being best friends with Mel Brooks for 65 years and counting, and how the two of them came up with their famous 2,000-year-old man routine. And speaking of 2,000-year-old men, he'll reveal his secrets for staying sharp and keeping his sense of humor at the tender age of 92. Coming up with comedy legend Carl Reiner in just a moment. From Hollywood to Washington, it's time for Kick-Ass Politics. And now here's your host, Ben Mathis. I'm so thrilled to be joined by a bona fide comedy god. You know him from so many things. He starred in everything from your show of shows and Caesar's Hour with Sid Caesar to great films like The Russians Are Coming, The Ocean's Eleven films, and of course, Mad About You, for which he won his ninth Emmy Award. The 2,000-year-old Man albums, which he recorded with Mel Brooks, are now comedy classics and won them a Grammy. He's a prolific writer-director whose credits include Oh God and Where's Papa, and arguably Steve Martin's best movies, including The Jerk, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid, The Man with Two Brains, All of Me... But what he's most proud of, probably, is having created The Dick Van Dyke Show. And he's written about it in a beautiful new book called Why and When the Dick Van Dyke Show Was Born. Carl Reiner, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. 
I absolutely love that introduction. May I make one correction, yes. which is somebody made this mistake about 100 years ago, and everybody uses it. <laughs> I have 12 Emmys, and I'm so proud of them because I have three children. And I can, I remember when I won the 12th one for Mad About You, I said, now I can split them three ways when I go and I can eat them. <laughs> <laughs> that works out well. So, so you have 12, but not is nine. Because <laughs> some, someone on Wikipedia shortchanged you, I have to warn you. And it stayed that way. Well, you know, I have to tell you, you have brought me so much joy over the years, Carl. Just last night, I gathered some friends, and we had a little bit of a Carl Reiner retrospective, I guess you could say. We watched about a half dozen episodes of the Dick Van Dyke show that were so funny oh and warm and relatable and just brilliant. And, and then we followed it up with Steve Martin and your classic, The Jerk. And I want to tell you something. We laughed till we cried. I, I had a couple of friends who hadn't even seen it before. And it's funny because, you know, there is this creative destruction to comedy where it's always building on itself and evolving, and what's funny to one generation isn't to the next. But I would submit to you that it's the funniest movie ever made, and I think you could sit an 80-year-old man or an adolescent boy in front of the TV to watch The Jerk, and they will laugh their asses off. That movie came to me because Steve Martin had written it with Carl Gottlieb and, and Michael Elias, and they asked me to come and direct. As Steve had never acted... Except in front of audiences of as big as 45,000 people, but he had never acted with another actor. But that movie was based on a line from his act. I was born a poor black child. <laughs> and from that, he grew this wonderful fantasy, the, uh, the jerk. And it, you're absolutely right. You cannot watch that picture and not laugh. Yeah, it's it's just brilliant, and it, it's one of a number of great comedy pairings you've had over the years. Um, the book, though, that you just wrote, again, it's called Why and When the Dick Van Dyke Show Was Born. It's wonderful, and it's packed with stories and photos. It's a beautiful book. But I was amused that you put the table of contents on the back cover where usually all the reviews and the quotes are, but you do have, in the beginning of the book, a pretty lofty laudatory quote that starts off the book. This person says, After four hours at the wheel of a Mississippi paddle boat, transporting folks to their homes, I am afforded no greater pleasure than retiring to my stateroom, turning on my new RCA Victor 7-inch television set, and watching Carl Reiner's hilarious Dick Van Dyke show. Signed, Mark Twain. <laughs> I know. I know. I, you know, Mark... Twain and I were brethren. I, I, he is the man I most, I most admire in the world as far as writing. I was uh, surprised on This Is Your Life, and they asked my wife what uh, kind of car I would like, and she said, he has a car. And I said, what do you really like? And they said, like uh, Mark Twain. And they gifted me on that show with the uh, complete works of Mark Twain signed by Mark Twain. Oh, wow. In anticipation of his death, he signed a he signed a bunch of books. He died three years before the books came out. Was he one of your comedy inspirations? Oh, he's. I think he was everybody's comedy inspiration. Yeah. He's, he's he wrote the uh, the definitive novel of all time. You know. Uh, yeah, and he was a lot like you. You know, he was kind of a polyglot. He liked to give lectures. So, and he he really kind of invented stand up comedy. He was a lot like me. Nobody was like him. He's, he was one of a kind, and I don't think we'll ever see the likes of him again. <laughs> well, when you were young, I'm curious, where did you get your interest in comedy from? You know, I think you're born with a funny bone, and it, but it's mainly uh, environmental. If your parents uh, uh, lean toward comedy, which my parents did, we watched the, we listened to the radio shows of the day, the Eddie Cantor show and the Jack Benny show and the Fred Allen show. And then when we went to movies, we, they always try to find a comedy, you know, even the Marx Brothers, Rich oh, yeah. Brothers. And I think uh, I was always able to, when I was a kid, when I would hear uh, somebody, there was a guy named Lou Holtz who was a great storyteller, and he told these wonderful jokes. And I was able to tell my friends, repeat these jokes and, and embellish them a little. And I realized I had a gift then of being able to, you know, make people laugh by not inventing anything then, but just embellishing things. 
And the Dick Van Dyke show was really based on kind of one of your early experiences. I guess you might be able to call it your big break when you were a writer and a co-star on Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows and Caesar's Hours. Now, that right. writer's room has become the stuff of legend. There was yourself, Mel Brooks, Neil Simon, uh, who else? Larry Gelbart, who created MASH, Mel right. Tolkien, right. Aaron Rubin, uh, you have uh, Michael Stewart, who wrote Hello, Dolly. I mean, yeah. yeah, and then a fellow named Tony Webster, who was one of the most brilliant writers. He was the only Gentile writer <laughs> in the room, and he was brilliant. Uh, that room, that writer's room, was really my college. I was an actor then. I had written material for myself, but listening to those guys, each one had a different kind of sense of humor. Huh. And to this day, of course, uh, nobody's ever made me laugh more than Mel Brooks. And uh, it was in the show of shows office that the 2,000-year-old man was born. Right, you and Mel. Uh, yeah, Mel was, uh, I, Mel was not working for the show of shows. Then he worked for Sid for about $35 a joke or something. <laughs> but Max Lieben thought he was too obstreperous. He wouldn't hire him. But Sid wanted him around. But the day I came to work, there was Mel standing up and talking about a Jewish pirate. <laughs> And he was complaining. He said, it with a Jewish accent, you know what it costs to uh, set sail these days? I can't afford it. He says, $3.25 for a yacht of sailcloth. I can't afford to pillage and rape anymore. <laughs> that was his first time I heard him. The following week, I came in, and I started to interview him. I said, here's a man who was at the scene of the crucifixion. Isn't that true, sir? And his first words were, oh, boy, as you were there. Oh, yeah. As you knew Jesus, he's a spin lad, right? Wore sandals, walked around with 12 other guys. They always came into the store, never bought anything. I gave them water. They were nice fellows. <laughs> anyway, that was the first lines I heard. And for the next 10 years, I interviewed him and just to keep myself laughing. You know, when it was dull in the office, I'd jump up and at the 2,000-year-old man, what the world was about. Well, yeah, and you for 10 years, you guys, this kind of became a party trick. And every party you would go, yeah, you was, guys, would everyone would want you to get up and do the 2,000-year-old man. Did you ever wish that you could just go to a party and relax? No, we loved doing it. A lot of parties were thrown. They would, would command performances. <laughs> I remember in New York, Alan J. Lerner and musical comedy writers had a party in their house so we could get up and do it. And it wasn't until 10 years. You know, the, we always thought that the Jewish accent being for some and brother oh, yeah. in 1945, Hitler, you know. Right, there was still a lot of anti-Semitism. Uh, just, just won it. And this was five years yeah. later. And we figured the Jewish accent was only for Jews and non-anti-Semitic Gentiles. <laughs> and uh, it was at a party after years of doing it for fun that there was three people who influenced our Putting it on record, one was uh, um, George Burns who said, really? "He says, is there an is there is there an album on this?" And we said, "No." He says, "Put it on our album, or I'm going to steal it." <laughs> Edward G. Robinson, make a play out of it. He says, "I'd like to play that thousand year old man." Oops. And I said, "It's two thousand year old." He says, "I can play any age." <laughs> <laughs> actually said that, and it was Steve Allen, bless him, who. Uh, who said, fellas, you got to put it on an album. He said, I have a, a company, World Pacific Jazz, take over the studio, and I have no, I don't want anything to do with it. You just wail. And we did. We got uh, 300 people. We we did three hours of ad living and put it, cut, cut it down to 47 minutes, and that became the 2,000-year-old Oh, man. yeah, it's a classic. It's a classic. Steve Allen, who... Oh yeah! But without him, we would have we would have gotten out to the yeah. To the he world. nurtured so many careers. He he was a he, wonderful human. He man. was a dear dear man. Yeah. He he cared nothing more than to get great comedy minds out, comedy talent into the world. Yeah. He he did that maybe a dozen times. Yeah. Well, I, I I'm curious because you know when you were working in that writers' room, it's almost. It's almost unfair that any show had that much talent. Was it just that Sid Caesar attracted great talent, or oh, was it Sid, that the experience was like a proving ground that built yeah, great I, talent? Yeah, I call them like the, uh, the flame that every moth came to want to buzz around. All the talented moths, they all wanted to write for Sid Caesar. A guy like uh, Larry Galbot, who was making a very good living writing 
jokes from millions of different. He was he was a, a rich writer, and when he came aboard, Sid Caesar, he got him from Bob Hope. Bob, he was a Bob Hope writer. Really? He used to write one liners for Bob Hope, you know, by the dozens. And I remember after being on our show for two years, Bob Hope called, and he told Sid, he said, "I'd like to." I'd like to get Larry back. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you an oil well for him. He wanted to trade <laughs> Larry me. for an oil well. That's how oh, yeah, he owned all that land. Was. Yeah. So being in the presence of those guys, you can only, a little bit of washes off on you is all you need. Yeah. A little bit is a, a yeah. lot when it comes from them. Well, you said that Sid Caesar was the greatest comedic talent in the history of TV. I, and I keep repeating that because I don't remember anybody... I ever worked with who can do what he did. And sometimes, you know, we were on the air and it was an hour show. You didn't have any time to, to cut pace or anything. And uh, I remember him ad living things. Sometimes he would find a groove, the audience would laugh, and he would embellish it with things you never, I never dreamed were coming. And Sid and I were playing pool. We are two Englishmen. At one point, Sid's cue stick went under the felt. And he picked it up and ripped the felt. And I'd say, good shot. You know, and it went on like that until one point that it broke in half. And I'm dying. I said, what is he going to do now? He's got to take a pool shot with him. He's got no cue stick. And he walked around looking for a good shot. And he wound up like he was using a polo mallet. And he <laughs> whacked at the ball. It flew off the table, went hit against the wall and bounced on the floor. And I had to say, good shot. And I, I literally bit my tongue. I had blood on my, oh my, on my lip. What, what was the most valuable thing you learned about comedy, working for him or working on that show? I think uh, mining your own life for, for funny things was what I finally started to do when I left that show. Huh. I remember saying to myself as I'm... Uh, my first foray into the situation comedy. After the show of shows, that form was dead until Carol Burnett brought it back 10 years right. later. And I was being offered situation comedies, and they weren't very good. My wife said, why don't you write one? I wrote 13 episodes of a thing called Good, good Heaven. Uh, no, not Good Heaven. Is uh, this Head of the Family? Head of the Family, the, right. Good the predecessor for Dick Van Dyke Dyke show. Show. Yeah. I'm talking about Good Heavens, a show I did. Um, Anyway, so I did this uh, head of the family. I got it financed. I did a pilot, and it turned out not to be too good. And uh, But I had 13 episodes, and my agent was all upset that they were lying around fallow, and gold could be mined. So he called in Sheldon Leonard, and Sheldon called me, oh, in and he yeah, said, brilliant producer. You know, I'd, I'd like to, uh, I, I think those shows are very good. We'd like to do them. I said, I don't want to fail with the same material. And, and this is a good impression of my He says, you won't fail. We'll get a better actor to play you. <laughs> he suggested Dick Van Dyke. Went to New York and saw Dick and Bye Bye Birdie, and I had never seen a more all-around talented man in my life. <laughs> the two men I work with, that I can say that about us, it's uh, Steve Martin and uh, Dick Van Dyke. Yeah, and did I read somewhere that you had to submit the script for Head of the Family to Joe Kennedy for approval. Yeah. What's well, the Peter Lawford put up the money for the original script, the original pilot, and he asked me to send one to Joe Kennedy. I said, why? <laughs> he said, well, Joseph P. Kennedy is the, you know, the seeing of the family, and he likes to see what we're doing with our money and make sure that, you know, the mores and the uh, ethics. And I said, he's going to be an arbiter of my ethics. And yeah. he's that whore master who's, <laughs> who's cuckolding his wife with... Gloria Swanson, who's a rum runner, <laughs> yeah. I, he's going to be. He's going to check my ethics. Yeah. Anyway, Talk about we didn't. Hypocrisy. We didn't. We did. We sent them one. We didn't listen to anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think he liked it, by the way. Oh yeah, you think so? Oh, he didn't get. He didn't come back with. No, any we didn't notes. get any, any <laughs> backlash from it. Yeah. Well, eventually, yeah, you brought it to Sheldon Leonard and turned it into the Dick Van Dyke Show. Um, and it was based on your experience uh, working for Sid Caesar on uh, your show of shows in Caesar's Hour. And right. Dick Van Dyke kind of plays you, the writer for this fictional comic uh, called right. Alan Brady, who was also who was played by you, who's loud, brash, egocentric. 
a lot of people, because it was inspired by your experience, assume that that character was Sid Caesar. But you say I that it's, he was nothing like that. Sid Caesar, Sid Caesar was a pussycat. Yeah. Uh, the, it, it will attest to the our friendship that we had lunch and dinner. We every Saturday night after the show, we, we went to dinner. We we went to foreign movies together during the week. We <laughs> we went to each other's houses, swam in each other's pools. No, we were dearest friends. But uh, it was a, an amalgam of of the kind of bosses that we knew about, like Milton Berle, who had a oh, whistle yeah. on his, around his neck all the time in rehearsal, and it was always berating people for not doing their jobs right. <laughs> and, the, and then there was uh, a guy named uh, uh, Phil Silvers who did a thing in Top Banana where he played a, an amalgam of all these, uh, Jackie Gleason being one of them. Oh, yeah, he never talked terror. to his writers. His writers would write, they'd flip the script, under his door in his hotel room, he never spoke to his writer. <laughs> so I said, you have to have somebody mean, and that's what I, I invented that guy. i come an amalgam of those three other yeah. people I knew about. Yeah, and you played him, too. I played him, too, yeah. <laughs> now, who who came up with uh, Dick Van Dyke's signature pratfall where he stumbles over the ottoman? Well, you know something? Uh, years ago, we were fighting for... Uh, Ratings, and, you know, if you didn't get the audience immediately, they would f- fish around and see what was on because they knew what, what the opening credits would be, and that, that took a little time. So I said to stop them, I called it a Hey May. I said, we've got to do something where he we start something, and they say, Hey May, come and let's see what he's going to do. This. He's going to do something funny. <laughs> and we got the idea that one week he would dr- fall over the ottoman and one week he would not. And people would come watch to see which one that was going to. Sit. <laughs> and I always said, let's do a premise very early in the in the thing. So we set a premise, and then and, and that was the hey may hey may come in. <laughs> you got to see what they're going to do this week. It's really crazy. Yeah, he was such so, is such is such a brilliant physical comedian. I mean, he does he things that, that only you never, can do in he cartoons. He never hurt himself. He, it yeah. was amazing how how he could fall and well, he is put together uh, like no like. I think Geppetto put him together because <laughs> yeah. he's like a he's like a puppet. He never hurts himself. Yeah, I mean he is. He's superhuman. By the I way, mean, to this day he's ninety now. Yeah, and he's still dancing and singing and jumping. And yeah, he, he's still. I I, own, I they gave him a big night at Disneyland uh, a couple nights a couple. Oh, weeks I saw that. Ago. And yeah. I was frightened to death. He was doing that chimney sweep dance on the chimneys. And that is, that is, you're asking to be killed. Yeah, he I mean, was pretty When spry. he did it originally, he, he said, I was scared to death because you're, you're way up there and no net. You're working <laughs> without a net. But he never misstepped. Yeah, Dick Van Dyke has more energy at 90 than I do at less than half of his age. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and then I'll be back for more with Carl Reiner. We'll be back in just a moment. Folks, do you love a good book, but you just don't have the time to escape the madness of everyday life and focus all of your attention on reading? Well, there's a perfect solution. Audiobooks from Audible.com. You can listen to them on your commute or during your workout, soaking in the tub or while you're cooking dinner, anywhere really. And Audible has over 180,000 titles available for download, which means you can probably get just about any book that you could buy in a regular bookstore Downloaded right to your smartphone, your tablet, or any MP3 player. How convenient is that? And right now, you can get a free 30-day trial and a free audiobook with a special promotion for our listeners at audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or click on the sponsor link on our webpage. Again, that's audibletrial.com backslash kickasspolitics. And now, back to the show. We're back, and today I'm talking with comedy legend Carl Reiner. Well, Carl, we were just talking about Dick Van Dyke and how spry and how sharp he is at age 90. And you're no slouch yourself at 92. i got to say, you seem to be doing pretty well. I probably would be jealous of you at that age. 
But the thing that I always wonder is I'm sure that you're used to people coming up to you and say, wow, you're still sharp at your age, as if they think you're, you know, they expect, no, it's like they expect it. you to be a vegetable I, or something. I love that. I can say it to myself because <laughs> while we're talking now, there's a guy in the other room. We're working on a new, new book that is, I'm so excited about it. It's me at 93, it's called. And uh, it's going to be a, 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 re, a really, a, it's a, a month. It's if my Samuel Pepys diary, I call it a graphic diary. Huh. Everything I ever do, mundane or interesting, this phone call might be in it tonight. Who knows? Oh, <laughs> but well, well, everything I expect I do, a royalty then. Putting drops in my <laughs> eyes is is filmed. We we we. Uh, it's got three hundred and something pages so far, huh. and about six hundred photos. By the way, the uh, the Van Dyke Show book, which is I I just adore. It's basically oh, it's what I write, wrote the book about was the thirty, the twentieth, twenty episodes that I did of the hundred and fifty episodes that we that were based specifically on something that happened to my wife and myself or my kids. So those are the twenty episodes I deal with and how and when, why and when the Dick Van Dyke Show was born. And I love doing that because yeah. I can show actual photos of the. Thing that happened in my life with my wife and my kids, I and how it translated into a uh, episode. And the one that comes to my mind immediately is never name a duck. I remember right. buying little ducklings in the Easter time and bringing them home. The kids were small; they were living in New Rochelle. And I remember putting the ducks in the sink and giving them Christ Krispies, <laughs> and the kids were so tickled. And the, the, duck, the ducks kept growing and growing. We put them in the bathtub. We were living in North Alta Drive then, I remember, when I just came out here in California, and they, the ducks kept swimming in the, in the swimming pool finally, and we looked at the bottom of the pool and saw this mess that they were making, <laughs> and we said, we've got to find a home for these ducks. And we actually, you know, with the kids, were about six and, you know, eight and 11 and 8 then, and we, Robbie and Annie, we took them to, to we got off the park where there was a flock of ducks, and we put... These two ducks who had names, yeah, we, I call them never name a duck, we call them Millie and Jerry. We put Millie and Jerry into the pool, and the other, a big duck came over and started nipping at these two little ducks, didn't want them in the group. <laughs> and my wife smartly brought a lot of breadcrumbs and bread pieces and threw it between the two, between the ducks and ours. And they all came over and started to eat, and our ducks who swam in with them, and we sat and left for a half hour while they, they were getting, they were getting uh, inculcated into, into yeah. the group. It yeah, was, acclimated. It was, it was a sad, lovely moment. Yeah, and you you do yeah. You know, that's one of the things that I think is so endearing about the Dick Van Dyke Show is that it is completely relatable, and you have episodes like that, and there was the one episode uh, where, uh, I forget I forget the title of the episode, but it's all about the Mary Tyler Moore character giving Rob a hard time about always picking up the check and having to be a big guy when he's oh, out at dinner. Oh, my husband is a check <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. That Which was based totally on relatable. something my wife always got upset of with me. I always pick up a check. She says, it's embarrassing sometimes. People want to pick up a check and get done it before they can get to it. We actually did a sketch on the show of shows based on the fact that my wife was always complaining about that. And in this show, I never forgot that. We were, Sid and I were fighting, two check grabbers, fighting for the check. And I grabbed the check and ran toward the uh, cashier. Sid followed me, <laughs> threw me over his shoulder, and carried me to the cashier. He, and before he got there, he threw his credit card. He said, use this one. <laughs> and it was hilarious in the show. But it was really based on the fact that it, we, that's, that's why the show worked. We, we based it on ourselves. And I said, we're not that much different than anybody else. Yeah, if you yeah. write about yourself and the mores that you go through, the family problems, I said, everybody's got the same problem. Yeah, it's so charming. But there is a chapter in here where you have a little bit of an, a scary encounter with McCarthyism and the Hollywood blacklist. How did that oh, come yeah. about? Well, that was, uh, I needed an actor who looked like Buddy, and I used a guy named Phil Leeds. And Phil Leeds was one of the blacklisted actors who hadn't broken the blacklist yet. And I used him. And uh, immediately after the show aired and 
the uh, network heads called me and said, where did you find that actor? And I said, <laughs> New York. They're full of these kind of wonderful actors. <laughs> but it was still still hanging in there. A few years earlier, when the blacklist was really going, and I was visited by the FBI in New, in oh, wow. New Rochelle, 9 o'clock really? in the morning. Yikes. Because when I was doing the show of shows, and Dick Van, no, the Sid Caesar show, they actually came in and they asked me, I understand you voted for the American Labor Party. And I knew there was no, uh, you know, you're not allowed. It's a secret, secret ballot. They're not allowed. It's that. Right. I decided that I was going to be so charming they would not be, they would not catch me on anything. So I became <laughs> one of them. I said, yes, I said, absolutely. I said, I hope you did. I said, Are you guys, did you guys vote for Wallace? I said, because he was, you know, uh, was vice, vice president. president, I yeah. said, and the, Businessman, he you know ran a strawberry farm. I hope you voted for him. And I did this <laughs> the whole time, to, 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 right to the end, where they even asked me, "Do you know any communists?" And I said, well, "I'm sure I do." He said, "Would you name them?" I says, "I says communists don't tell you their names. They that's you know they you guys like you come around chasing them." I said, "They." They, they, I'm not you're out there because you guys tell me they're out there. That but is I a was brilliant like, way to answer that Trump. question. Yeah, that was brilliant. But, but uh, they all they also asked me. They said, "Did you MC a thing at Carnegie Hall uh, for Edward Barsky, Doctor Barsky, a known communist?" I said, "I didn't know he was a communist, but I did an interview him, and I do it again." They said, "Why?" And I said, "Well, he's the guy who invented plasma, and and it, on the jeep he used a, to extrude plasma from blood, which saved millions of lives during the war." And I said it was also at Carnegie Hall. I said, every actor's dream is to MC at Carnegie Hall. And here I have a chance to MC at Carnegie Hall and do it for a great man. And I said, gentlemen, if you guys, if I ever have a big event, I'm your guy. I'd be happy to MC. <laughs> I was, I chopped the shit out of them. They left all. They left me alone. Yeah, they they probably went back to J. Edgar Hoover and said, uh, you know, that Carl Reiner, he's our kind of guy. Don't worry about yeah. him. <laughs> he's one anyway, of us. That's, that's in the other book. <laughs> but, uh, no, the Dick Van Dyke book that you, you're talking about is was a labor of love because I, yeah. I, when I when I remembered uh, shivering while I asked my wife to marry me, I put the same thing in Robin Paul right. and Laura. He's shivering in the car. <laughs> And we had funny lines there where he says, you're shivering. He says, well, people in my family always shiver when they ask somebody to marry them. <laughs> he says, is that what you're doing? Yes. He says, now you're shivering. Why are you shivering? He says, my family, every time you accept a marriage, you we shiver. <laughs> is that what you're doing? Yeah. Anyway, that was the version of it. But uh, yeah, I, was, I was so happy to be able to duplicate what I, you know, I had done in real life. Yeah, there are. There are so many great stories that came from your real life. And it's so, like I said, it's just uh, the thing that come, I take away. Is it funny? Yes. And it's so relatable. You know something? While I was doing this show, when I started the show, I knew we had something special. I didn't know someday you were going to call me and talk about it. <laughs> but I knew we had something special. And I told any writer who worked with me, I said, we use no slang of the day. I said, I have a feeling this is going to be a forever show. That would get repeated. And I yeah. said, we use slang if we call a gun a gat or a girl a mall or something like that. <laughs> I said, don't use any of the cliches. And I said, I have a feeling this thing will last. Well, I was prophetic about that because yeah. I'm so happy. This is the biggest thrill I ever got is when people come up to me. And this has happened at three different generations because it's a long time now. A, kid will come, a man will come up to me and say, I was a kid, they'd say, and I watched the show, and I knew I was funny, but I knew I didn't want to get up in front of people to, to, to talk, but I knew I could write it. And I became a writer. I didn't know there was such a thing as a writer. I thought all comedians wrote their own material. Oh, and wow. that wasn't told to me once, but maybe four dozen times, but yeah. in different eras. Like between 15 and 20 years later, I'm still hearing it. I heard it. Oh, I was on the Conan O'Brien show, and I started to tell this story. And he said, I'm one of those guys. I wow. was watching your, wow. the show as a kid, and I said, gee, maybe maybe I could be a, you know, a writer, you know. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. that alone is a huge contribution. And yeah, yeah, it was the first show that really kind of showed the inside look at what a writer does on a TV show. Right. Uh, it, yeah, it's just so wonderful. And one of your sons, some people may not know, is Rob Reiner, the brilliant director who did When Harry Met Sally and Princess Bride, played Meathead and all the family. When he was a little kid, was he precocious? Could you tell that he had the comedy gene? Oh, he he, he was a precocious kid in that he, first of all, he has a photographic memory to this day. <laughs> when we did the 2,000-year-old man in the living rooms for friends, he was like six, seven years old. He got it. He used to sit on the steps and laugh when he was about 15. Really? He actually gave us a joke. <laughs> Robin, uh, Mel and I were in the living room trying to work out something for one of those uh, Hollywood Palace shows, and we, we didn't ad lib. We had 12 minutes to do something or something, and we had to repeat something. And that was hard for us to do, to repeat something that we had done before. And Rob oh, yeah. came up with the idea of uh, the invention of applause. Uh, years, years earlier, during the, uh, the uh, uh, Neanderthal days, when somebody did something funny and you liked it, you you, you smack your face. Oh, is that funny? <laughs> and they said, then they hurt their faces. If it's right funny. So they pulled their faces out and just applauded. Their, let their palms come together instead of hitting their faces. With it. <laughs> Rob was a kid then. But Rob, uh, by the way, uh, I've just written something that I said, my three favorite movies of all time, The Count of Monte Cristo, Random Harvest, and The Prince's Bride. And that's Rob's picture. Yeah, so that's, that's your my son three there. favorite pictures of all time. Yeah, and Rob was proud. He, he sat in the stands when he was very young watching rehearsals when he was 14 to 16 with his friend Albert Brooks. And they were, he just absorbed things. I never gave him one bit of advice ever. Albert Brooks, like the comedian, they, they were good friends growing up? They were very dear friends growing up. As a matter of fact, uh, they did things together and. Uh, they were Brooks and Reiner. Albert oh, you're Brooks kidding and... me. That's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just they, like you and They Mel. were doing little improvs together, but Albert Brooks is one of the funniest human oh, yeah. beings that ever lived. Yeah, and, uh, wonderful guy. But Robbie has made some of them, maybe the best movies ever made. He's, you know, he's, And he's got one coming out now come, called uh, LBJ that's coming out by the, the election time, and it's going to be a blockbuster. I saw it. It's so brilliant. It's so good. He's made movie. He, he, I think there's 15 movies. I don't know how many he's made, but each one of them, he outdoes himself. Yeah. A few good men. Yeah. You, you think know, he'll uh, ever go into politics? He, I know that he flirts with it. Every <laughs> well, now he and was. Then. He was. You know, there was one point they wanted to run for governor. Right. I remember. And he, and he said, "I can't even get." To, uh, I I only get four. I don't get enough votes in my own home for that. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't couldn't carry my household. No, I'm glad he never went. But he's very political. He's a he's very he knows about everything. He's one of yeah. the smartest guys. I yeah, know. yeah, he is. I just want to ask you. You and Mel Brooks have a friendship of God. I don't even know what sixty years. I mean, it, it's something to aspire to for all of us. I think. Um, you still hang out, I think. I heard every week. Uh, what do you guys yeah, talk no, about? Every night, he comes over every night, maybe one night a week. He might not, but it's usually seven nights a week. <laughs> and we watch movies. Really? We watch television. What kind of movies we do you eat, guys we like? Talk. Yeah, and, uh, we sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, get up. And, yeah, sometimes I'll stall. He's, what, what, what happened? I said, you fell asleep. And you should see this one. It's very good. What, what kind of movies do you guys usually watch? Comedies? Or? Well, we watch we watch the classics, but there are a couple of the movies that are being made today that are. Yesterday we watched uh, uh, Saul. You know, get, uh, better call Saul. Oh yeah, I like the Bob Odenkirk. Yeah, it's a good show. But there are an awful lot of good little things. But of course, the game shows. When we're eating dinner, we always watch oh, yeah? uh, Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune. Really, it's, uh, very easy to watch. Very. E Good to watch while you're eating, you know, so you don't upset yourself. And there's a couple of series on that are no pretty good now. We were watching the uh, man, uh, the man in the castle. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that. Yeah, about the Nazis. Yeah. Yeah, it's about the Nazis in 1962. Yeah, scary. The Japanese taking over America. That was yeah, that's a scary show. Wonderfully inventive and frightening. Uh, are there any comedians or, or young comedic actors that you guys like? Oh, yeah, there's so many. I mean, this morning I was 
watching Trevor Noah. You know, all the guys that that uh, were spawned by John Stewart's show yeah. turned out really good. Samantha B and 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 the, and the talk show host today. We have a raft of wonderful talk show hosts. They're funny. They're talented, and they they're good interviewers, serious interviewers. Starting with Colbert and Fallon and Seth Myers and Conan. I mean, we were gifted with uh, great late night people. Yeah, well, they've built on your legacy. So uh, it's somewhere in there, there's a little bit of credit that goes right back to you, I think. Oh, you're very kind to say. Well, that. again, the book is called Why and When the Dick Van Dyke Show Was Born, and you can order it. It's not on Amazon, right? You guys self published, right? Yeah, it's called randomcontent.com, and if you buy it and contact us, I will personally autograph it and even uh, say nice things about whoever is writing it and your wife. <laughs> well, that's that's really nice. That that alone is worth it right there. No, I get more fun out of that. I really do. I just autographed a raft of them the other day, and it is tiresome, but it's the kind of... Fun tires. <laughs> what, what if you get someone who writes in and says, I'm Adolf Hitler, write something nice about me? <laughs> yeah, I, I would not. Well, first of all, I know it's not Adolf Hitler. Okay. It might but, be Mel uh, Brooks, actually. But you know, it's funny. <laughs> Playing a prank. You say Adolf Hitler, to me, that could wake up Mel Brooks in a second. The, oh, those words and the words if that... Anything about Adolf Hitler, Mel's there. You know, he wrote Springtime for Hitler. Right. You know? He was, you know, it's amazing how he was able to find a way to denigrate Hitler in a comedy. I mean, yeah. that was so brilliant. Yeah, he, he said that, so, I think he said somewhere along the way that Hitler was the, the greatest gift to comedians, or his greatest inspiration was Adolf Hitler. <laughs> well, Carl... We have one now. There's an inspiration now. There's a guy, a guy called uh, Trump. Tell me about it. Yeah, yeah I know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The comedians will be dining have, off of him for years. It, <laughs> In in one of, in my newest book, I have a uh, put dump, Trumpster in the dumpster. You yeah. know, I I just had the last guest that I had on the show was a guy who has a new podcast called uh, Trump Cast, and he is he's vowed to to expose Trump every day until Trump gets out of politics forever. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a good quest. That's a good. It is a, a noble quest. Awesome. Now wait a second. I'm going to give you a gift, which I just. Put in my uh, pocket here, which I read something that Einstein said. Wouldn't you like to see that? I would. Here it is. It's, I got it. I got it. I swear I got it. No, that's my check. <laughs> that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. That's not it. Here it is. Here it is. It says intellectual growth should commence at birth and cease. After death, Albert Einstein. <laughs> Words Isn't to live Isn't that a goodie? By. Isn't that a goodie? That is. That is. And, <laughs> and you're living proof of it, too. Well, Carl, you are truly a mensch among mensches. I, I don't think oh. you know, I can even measure how much joy you've brought myself and millions of others. Well, my, my, my dream is that to be alive in a few months and have you interview me about my my. Me at 93, which is my next work. Well, you stick around, and I guarantee you, <laughs> wild, wild horses can't stop me. <laughs> okay. Carl, thank you again. I, I adore you, and thank you so much for coming on the show. And like I said, thank you for just making all of us laugh our asses off for years and years. Thank you so much. Thanks again to Carl Reiner for coming on the show. And believe it or not, folks, Carl Reiner is a prolific tweeter. Who says he can't teach an old dog new tricks? So if you want to laugh, follow him on Twitter at at Carl Reiner. And if you enjoyed today's podcast, you should definitely order a copy of his new book, Why and When the Dick Van Dyke Show Was Born. It's got lots of great stories and wonderful photos from the set and of his family life that inspired the show. It's self-published, so you can't get it on Amazon or in stores. But if you order it on his site at randomcontent.com, like he said, you can include a message for him, and he'll even personalize it and sign it to you or whoever you want. Again, the site where you can order it is called randomcontent.com. Be sure to subscribe to Kick-Ass Politics on iTunes and leave us a review. 
And if you really want to help out, then donate to our GoFundMe campaign at GoFundMe.com backslash kickasspolitics. Or click on the donate button on our website at kickasspolitics.com. Follow us on Twitter at at KA Politics or visit Kickass Politics on Facebook and recommend Kickass Politics to your friends on your social media. And as always, I welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at kickasspolitics.com. On the next podcast, we'll get a little more serious when I talk with Stephen McAnderson head of emergency operations for the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies in Geneva. We'll talk about his experience on the front line of some of the biggest disasters of the past two decades, including the 2014 super typhoon that hit the Philippines, the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, and his experience most recently confronting a very different sort of disaster as head of emergency operations for the Syrian refugee crisis coming up with Stephen McAndrews on the next podcast. But for now, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass Politics. Kick-Ass Politics is a trademark of Mathis Entertainment, Inc.